themselves, okay? Now, Jesus knew that not everyone liked him. He knew. He knew the religious leaders He knew that the religious leaders were angry with him. They hated Jesus. They were so jealous of Jesus because the, they were afraid that the people loved Jesus more than they loved them. And they did not like him. In fact, they hated him so much they wanted to kill Jesus. But Jesus still had his special friends. Those special friends were called what? The D. The D. Good job. But Jesus still had his special friends, his disciples. Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Simon, Matthew, James, Thomas, Thaddeus, and Judas. They had been his friends for a long time and had traveled with Jesus. He had taught them many things. Now, boys and girls, listen. These disciples went everywhere. They had seen all the miracles that Jesus had performed, turning water into wine, raising Lazarus from the dead, healing blind eyes and deaf ears. They saw all these miracles. One night they got together for dinner, and while they were eating, Jesus got up, and he put a towel around his waist, and he poured water into a big bucket. Then he went around and started to wash the disciples' feet. Wash the disciples' feet. When Jesus got to Peter's feet, Peter said, you know, Peter, he's just like me. His mouth gets ahead of his brain. You know, he just says stuff. He doesn't think about it. He said, Jesus, I can't let you wash my feet. And Jesus said, listen, boys and girls. Jesus said, if you don't let me wash your feet, you can't follow me. Well, Peter said, well, in that case, Lord, wash my head, wash my hands, and wash my feet. You see, Peter loved Jesus. He loved him. After Jesus washed his friend's feet, he asked, Do you guys understand what I just did? I showed you how to be kind to each other. I am your Lord and your teacher, and if I can be kind and help you, then you can be kind to help each other. So Jesus taught us a very important lesson, didn't he? <clears throat> now, when this story takes place, it's getting time for Jesus to leave this earth and go back to heaven. And when they were eating dinner, Jesus had a lot on his mind because he knew that one of his close friends, one of the disciples, was going to walk up to him in the garden and kiss him on the cheek for 30 pieces of silver and tell the Roman soldiers, this is the guy you want to arrest. Who, who did that? Which disciple betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver? Come on by the trivia, kids. No. No, Judas. Yeah. Judas. Judas did. And he knew that Judas was going to betray him. And he also knew that another disciple 
when they were out and about, would tell the Roman soldiers, well, I don't know that man Jesus, not just once, but three times. What was his name? He betrayed Jesus three times, denied Jesus three times. Peter, that's right. But listen, <coughs> Jesus knew that God had a plan and that God had everything under control. Under control. So he got up and he started washing the disciples' feet. And he got to Peter. And Peter says, no, no, Lord, no. You are the king of kings. You're the son of God. You're not going to wash my feet. And he said, if you don't let me wash your feet, you can't follow me. You see, back then, boys and girls, hundreds of years ago, when Jesus walked on this earth, the lowest of the lowest of the lowest servants washed the guest feet. The lowest. They had the dirtiest nastiest job. Now I want you to think about this for a minute. Back when Jesus walked on this earth, did we have cars to travel in? No. How'd they get about? Walk. Donkeys, camels, mostly walk. That's right. Now did we have paved roads like this highway out here? Did they have paved roads? No. no. What was their roads made out of? Sand and dirt. Most people back then didn't have shoes, but if they had shoes, what kind of shoes were they? Tennis shoes? No, no. Sandals, that's right. So think about this, boys and girls. Everybody's traveling on the same road, no shoes, dirt and sand, animals on the same road. Do you think it was a little messy on the roads? No. Huh? Do you think it was? So would you want to be a servant? washing people's feet after they have been through all that mess. So you see, the lowest of the lowest of the lowest servants washed the people's feet. And there was Jesus washing the feet of his friend. Jesus, the Son of God and the King of Kings. Now, boys and girls, Jesus did this to teach his disciples a lesson, and that is you should serve people, meaning that you should help people. You should love others more than you love yourself. When Pastor Dave was in the youth ministry, he had such a heart for teaching his young people how to serve. He had a heart for it. His heart burned to teach kids how to serve because you don't see that much anymore. And it doesn't mean, uh, it doesn't mean washing somebody's feet. You might, but it means like mowing your elderly neighbor's yard. It means going out of the way to help somebody. It means opening the door while somebody's coming through the door. And not just busting and barreling right on through. Open the door when you see an elderly person coming up. It could mean sitting and holding somebody while they're crying and they're sad. It could mean going to Mexico and teaching vacation Bible school. It could mean going to Austin to the soup kitchen and feeding the um, homeless. But they felt it was important to teach the youth to serve. Everyone, everyone should be a servant and help the people around you. Now, Jesus showed his disciples how to treat others by his example when he washed their feet. He told them that he needed to treat other people like he had treated them. Now, boys and girls, Jesus was the greatest person, the most amazing person to ever walk on the face of this earth. And he did not think that he was too good to wash somebody's feet. Today, as you go home, I want you to think about this. What are some things that you can do to be a servant? What are some things that you can do that you can help others? Because this is one way we can be more like Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you today um, for this example. We thank you for being our example. We thank you for showing us how to serve others, Lord. We may not need to wash their feet, Father, but there's so many other ways that we can serve and help the people around us. Help us to pay attention to the needs of the people around us, Lord. We love you so much, and we thank you for the lessons that you teach. In your name we pray, amen. amen. Thank you.
birthdays or anniversaries.
Garrett's doing this, like I said, Wednesday. It'll be showing up there, but not. And it's going to get real loud here in a minute. We're playing. I can yell. I'll put my throat can hold up. I'm just going to talk real loud until we get to that point. Okay. Hopefully y'all can hear me back there. I'll try to be as loud as I can until we get this figured out, then I'll blow you out. But today we're looking at the 10th chapter of Ecclesiastes, which we see I have titled Advice on Everyday Life. Because when you read this chapter, you see that it goes into like Proverbs. Almost each sentence can be its own message. So we see he's telling us a lot of really good, detailed things about life. And there it is. <laughs> God, wow. Ooh. Yeah, there it was. Okay. Now I don't have to yell, but then it goes back down. <laughs> I oh, know. We'll get it figured out. All right. I'm back to where I was. There's a lot of good advice in this section. We've seen going through this, he has taught us a lot of things, mostly about death, life, wealth, you know, unfulfilled living without the Lord, all of that building up to all of this. And this chapter, in chapter 11, and chapter 12 is where we get the practical advice on how to live. How to make it through all this misery that we see in the world. Because I'm sorry, if you're alive today, which you are because you're here, this world is pretty miserable. We watched a, a movie yesterday, one I've never seen. I, I know. Crazy. But it was Bedtime Stories by Adam Sandler. It was a... PG rated one, but he told the kids at the very beginning of that, when he started telling them these bedtime stories that come to life and actually started happening, that there are no happy endings in life. Life always ends miserably. It always messes up. There's always the good guy don't win. And I'm here to tell you, there's a lot of truth to that statement. The good guy doesn't always win. There's many times as we've studied through this book where we see that the bad guy actually comes out on top. That's what we looked at last week, where it talked about how, you know, the righteous are dealt with as how the wicked should be. And the wicked get ahead. We see that a lot in life. But the problem with that statement is, is yeah, it can be true here, but in the end, the good prevails. Because God is in victory. So we need to look at that focus. That's what we always need to have our eyes on. That's what Ecclesiastes, the whole book, that is the main thing it teaches, and we will see that in chapter 12 abundantly clear in two more weeks. But we need to keep our eyes on the very end because at the very end of everything, victory is ours because of Jesus Christ. So when all this tragedy, all this struggle, all this misery, all this death, all this heartache, all this pain, all this suffering that we face, Every single day, we can face it with joy because we know how everything ends. So that's what this book teaches us. It shows us that. And it tells us many times over and over and over again not to go the way of the fool. And that's what we see mainly in this section here, chapter 10. It is a big section about why going the path of folly, foolishness, is foolish and ignorant and stupid, if you will. Let's just be blunt. It's stupid to walk that path. If you see the good to do, but you go the path of foolishness, you're being stupid when the good is right there. It's like passing up a ribeye steak for the trash can slop is what it is. And I don't care if you're a vegetarian. It's better to eat that ribeye steak than trash can slop. The thing is, we, we do that. We're very prone to that. We're drawn to the stench of foolishness. That's one of our big things. We're drawn to that. And that's what we're seeing right here in this, in verse 1, where he talks about it. Right here, he says, Dead flies make the perfumer's ointment give off a stench, so a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. The stench of foolishness. We're drawn to that. It comes in, and that's the thing we need to understand. Just as Jesus taught the disciples 
and taught it all through, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Whenever you make bread, when you make a bunch of them, because you, know, you make, say, two dozen bread, you just put like a small, like half teaspoon or a teaspoon worth of yeast in there, and it leavens the whole lump. It makes it all full of yeast, and it'll swell and rise. Just that tiny, tiny bit, when you have like four pounds worth of all the other ingredients, just that small half teaspoon will make the whole lump rise. That's what this is about. It takes that one little stinky fly to get in there to ruin the perfume, the ointment. And death, you know, back then, they didn't have the ways of embalming and things like we do today. So they covered with ointment. That's what you read with Jesus when he was crucified. And Joseph of Arimathea shows up with 75 pounds of spices and ointment to mask the stench of death. That's what they did. But it just takes a little bit to ruin that perfume, that good smell. And that's what it is with life. If we go that path of folly and foolishness, what we see is that horrible stench start emanating out. And another thing this shows us is because we said, it says it outweighs wisdom and honor. We too often give way too much thought to foolishness and all of that, and that's what people talk about. We always go that path. We don't talk wisdom enough, right? We get too hung up talking in the negatives, don't we? We get too hung up talking about the foolish mistakes or this or that instead of the positives. If we start focusing on the wisdom aspect of life, what Christ has told us, and we start talking about that over the mistakes made, then we'll start walking in this path more than this path. Because when you keep talking about something, when you keep dredging it up and bringing up all that folly and all that foolishness and all that misery and all that ignorance that we've done, you have a tendency to fall back in it. That's why talking about the past, sometimes if you've buried it, you've got to get it out. That's one thing. But if you constantly, continually keep talking about the past, you keep living in the past. And that's foolishness. We've got to look to the future. That's why I started by saying we've got to keep our eyes focused on the very end because no matter what you're going through in life, that end goal, that end victory, that end that is victory in Jesus Christ is already won. So keep focused there. That's the wisdom of life. That's walking the path of wisdom and not getting hung up in the stench of foolishness, which will drag you down, which will make you miserable. So wise people will avoid that folly. Wisdom is not constantly hanging in that foolish mistake. So what you did this mistake? That's behind you? Did you learn from it? Are you moving past it? Are you growing from that? Has it taught you the path of righteousness and the right way to live? Or are you still going to go back and live in that mistake? So what that you did this, that you failed the test, that you failed this, that maybe you didn't get that job? Are you going to continue hanging there? Or are you going to learn from why you didn't get it? What happened? What you missed? And grow and continue moving on? Or are you going to hang in that? Are you going to let that one little fly get in there and stay in there? Or are you going to get it out so it don't ruin that perfume, that beautiful smell? That's the question. That's what he's telling us here. That's the advice. Live life that way. Walk in that path. Live well. And then as we see, as we're fixing to read on the rest of the chapter, verses 2 through 20, what he tells us. So let's read. A wise man's heart inclines him to the right, but a fool's heart to the left. Even when the fool walks on the road, he lacks sense, and he says to everyone that he is a fool. If the anger of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your place for For calmness will lay great, lay great offenses to rest. There is an evil that I have seen under the sun, as it were an error proceeding from the ruler. Folly is set in many high places, and the rich sit in low places. I have seen slaves on horses and princes walking on the ground like slaves. He who digs a pit will fall into it, and a serpent will bite him who breaks through a wall. He who quarries stones is hurt by them, and he who splits logs is endangered by them. If the iron is blunt and one does not sharpen edge, he must use more strength, but wisdom help ones, helps one to succeed. If the serpent bites before it is charmed, there is no advantage to the charmer. The words of a wise man's mouth win him favor, but the lips of a fool consume him. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is evil madness. A fool multiplies words, though no man knows what is to be, and who can tell him what will be after him. 
The toil of the fool wearies him, for he does not know the way to the city. Woe to you, O land, when your king is a child, and your princes feast in the morning. Happy are you, O land, when your king is the son of nobility, and your princes feast at the proper time for strength and not for drunkenness. Through sloth, the roof sinks in, and through indolence, the house leaks. Bread is made for laughter, and wine gladdens life. And here's one that's going to throw everybody. And money answers everything. Even in your thoughts, do not curse the king, nor in your bedroom curse the rich, for a bird of the air will carry your voice, or some winged creature tell the matter. Some of that's kind of confusing, huh? Especially money answers everything. If for Solomon is really, and they're like, hey, hey, money's bad, don't, don't. Now money answers everything. you got to understand, he's talking about a fool through these whole verses. It's almost every bit of it about a fool, the foolish way, the foolish mind. Bread gladdens the heart. Or his laughter, wine gladdens life, and money answers everything. How many people have said that statement in life? Money answers no. You just give me that money, and I guarantee you I'll be happy. People say that, and it's incorrect. So what we see in this is he tells us how to avoid foolish mistakes. By telling what this is, we see how to avoid it. We learn the path of the right, the way to walk, by looking at this. Because if you follow this path, you're going to go to a pit. You're going to fall in that pit. You're going to be bit by that serpent. We all know who the serpent is. We know what he has done. Did God really say? Did he? Did he? That's the question that we have to face every single day. So don't let this serpent bite you. Look to the Lord and trust him. Because the serpent is going to say, did God really say? Or he's going to say, he did say this, like he did with Jesus. Do you know how to respond to that? Do you know the right path? Do you know how to answer, money answers everything? Or are you going to fall on that track? See, the problem, what we've got to understand, is like oil and water, sort of fools in the wise. No matter how much you shake oil and water, it's going to separate. You can shake it, have the most intense shaking thing in the world, whatever you want to do, it doesn't matter. It's eventually going to separate again. It will not stay together. So we need to understand that fools and the wise are the same way. You cannot stay joined to the foolish ways if you are in the wisdom of Christ. You will be miserable. You will be bitter. You will be confused. You will be lost. Even though you're saved, you will be lost because the ways of the fool and the way of the wise cannot stay together. So what he tells us right here, there's two paths of life. You go to the right you got wisdom. You go to the left, you're foolish. And this is not talking about politics. I've seen way too many people take this section of scripture. That's why I tell you all the time, you've got to read the word of God in context and not take it. Anybody can take this section of scripture. And I want to tell you, I've seen political pundits take this section and make a statement about it. And they're incorrect. All they do is show their ignorance of scripture when they do that. And it makes me go, yeah, I'm not voting for you either. But it's not about politics. What it's about is the right hand in ancient times was about honor and power. That's why Christ said, I go to the right hand of the Father. To the right hand, the right hand. John and James, hey, can we sit on your right and your left? You know, let us have that position. The right hand is of power and honor. Left hand, sorry, Cody, was seen as a birth defect. Left-handed people were seen as not right. It is an incomplete deal in this ancient time. And still today, we have a lot of people that kind of have that mindset. Lefties are a little off. They're not. I mean, they can be, but so can us right-handed people. I promise. If you could spend five minutes in my brain, you'd be like, what is wrong with this guy? <laughs> so the right hand, does, this is not speaking about what it's talking about. is power or a little bit of just, there's a little something off. It's not quite right. So the fools, this is how they distinguished back then. You go to the left, there's something wrong. You go to the right, you've got wisdom. So that's the two paths. Which path are you walking? Or are you trying to stay that middle ground? I'm telling you, that wide gets wider and wider, and you can't walk that middle ground. Before long, you're going to fall. you got to pick one. There's two paths. So which one are you going to follow? Which one are you going to do? Which one are you going to be down? Because I'm telling you, the fool always makes himself known. 
Verse 3 tells us that. He walks up after him. He just shouts out, I'm a fool. I'm an idiot. I'm stupid. We see it all the time. They may not say it in those words, but they let it be known real quick where they're at. We're seeing it in this world right now. People claiming to be wise make themselves a fool. When they shout all this nonsense that we're seeing in the world out there, when they try to say that drag queen story hour is good, they've made themselves a fool. When they say there's more genders than male and female, they have showed themselves a fool. When they say a man and a man and a woman and a woman can marry, they have shown themselves a fool. Because it goes against God's order and it goes against nature. You don't even have to be a Christian to see the differences in the error of those statements. People will always make themselves known a fool because they open their mouth. That's why sometimes, that's why scripture says, it's better keep your mouth closed and open it and show yourself a fool because it will happen. And we all do it. We all open mouth, insert foot, don't we? If you say no, you either haven't lived long enough or you're lying, one. Because we all do it. Every single person in this room has open mouth and inserted foot. I've done it from right here. I've said some things, I'm like, wait a minute, that wasn't right. It happens. Sometimes it's best for us just to keep our mouths shut. It's gone, which we see further down here where he talks about stay in your place or calmness lays many offenses to rest. That's what it's about. That's what we see. So the thing is, we've got to be careful because we will show ourselves fools. And we see it a lot with our leaders, people that are put in a position of authority. If you want to really see if somebody's a fool, put them in a position of authority. That's where it really comes out. And that's what we see next, because stature doesn't make one wise. Just because you've been put into a place of authority doesn't mean you're wise. Anybody here seen the show? Or, you know, the miniseries, Band of Brothers? You know, Captain Sobel? They're at their basic. That guy was put into a ranking position, but he was a fool. He knew how to draw them together, make them hate him and make them a unit, but he did not know how to lead. He made massive mistakes. He feared Lieutenant Winters, who was actually a leader. So he was always trying to make him into a spot where he couldn't be. And that's what we see in this text where it talks about slaves on horseback and basically the princes walking. What that's talking about is the slaves, the fools, the people who knew nothing were placed into high-ranking positions while people that should have been there were kept out of it. Because that foolish ruler that we read about in 917, who yells and screams and does all that, shouts and shouts down the wisdom of people, that's what this is talking about. It's continuing that, that flow. Stature does not mean you have wisdom. So just because you move up doesn't mean anything. Sometimes, and here, here if you're working for somebody that's not real bright, and all of a sudden you start advancing, you maybe need to look at some things. I'm not saying anything against anybody, but sometimes when you start moving up amongst the fools, there's something there. Maybe they're setting you up to be a fall for them. You never know. We need to always be cautious of life, what is going on in it, because a foolish leader will start putting people into place that they think they can be, that they're not going to be questioned by, right? That's what this is about. They will insult, they will do all these foolish things, they will do this and do all that, which we've seen in the world. Wise leaders are always pointing to other people, giving them credit. Because if you're a true leader, you do nothing without the people with you. Just as a quarterback on the field is nothing without his line, his running back his receivers. I don't care how good he is. If he has nobody else out there but himself, he's going to be mucked out. You must look to other people and not be a proud and arrogant ruler. You can't be proud like that. As we see in this text, he goes on and he talks about how he sets all these people. He does all these things. He has all this so he tries to take his anger out. He yells at others. He's mad at others. He takes everything out at them. And that's why it says if you are in a place and you have somebody like that, remain calm, keep mouth shut, focus on what you're doing, that calmness will lay that aside. Because an arrogant, prideful person, what they do is they yell and they get loud and they try to shut you up. 
So if you just sit there and stay quiet and they start yelling and they're being loud, what have you done? You've shown who the fool is and who is the wise. As I've said many times up here, put teeth marks in your tongue. Bite that thing and don't let it spew anything out that will cause more problems. Because the foolish rulers we see going on in this section, he will put foolish people in place. And a foolish leader with foolish people is going to make foolish mistakes, and they're always going to cause grief, and it's always going to be miserable, it's always going to be ignorance, everywhere, all the time, but somebody in there by staying focused on the deal, focusing on the end, as I've told you, don't let the things of this world distract you, focus on the end, and you will be able to stay calm and stay mindful of what is going on and make a change, rather than yelling and screaming back. We've got to be cautious of all of that. Because down here, this foolish work part that we see in verses 9, 8, 9, 10, and 11, where it talks about he who digs a pit will fall into it, the serpent will bite him and breaks through a wall. It doesn't matter. You're, you know, you're doing foolish things and you're acting stupid in what you're doing. You may fall in. Or, as some have taken this verse, some commentators that I've read this week, take this to be talking about criminal activity. You start following the foolish path. Digging a pit in ancient times was usually to set a trap for someone to fall into. Breaking through a wall and getting bit by a serpent is you trying to break in and steal something and you never know what's on that other side. It could be that. So don't do foolish things. Be mindful of everything you do and always try to walk the path of righteousness. Be able to go to sleep at night with what you've done that day. And I don't care where your conscience is, if you know it's wrong and you do wrong and you can still sleep at night, maybe you better get yourself in check with the Lord. Because it's not good. Swing on a dull axe. Who are, who's done that? Yeah, trying to chop wood with a dull axe. Heck of a workout, but terrible, productive work. You don't get anything accomplished. So the thing is, what he says here, the one who has wisdom will stop and sharpen that so they can do better work. But also, look at it this way. The ruler, how many in here have worked for a job and you've worked your tail off and you got abused for that work? They just constantly, continually kept pouring more work onto you, more work onto you, more work onto you, more work onto you. A smart employer will know that his employee, who is a highly productive worker, needs time to rest and be sharpened so they can continue that highly productive work. So whether you're a boss or you're an employee, take note of that and realize that you have to take time for rest. You have to sharpen yourself. If you work seven days a week, 12 hours a day, you're eventually going to dull and not be nearly as productive. If you're making yourself work like that, stop it. And God gave us a day of rest, at least one day. You may not like vacations, you may not have anything else, but God has put it in there and it's all through Scripture, all the way even through the New Testament. Take a day of rest and rest. Sharpen yourself so you don't fall. You know what else happens when you don't sharpen yourself? You fall into the path of foolishness. You start going down a path of darkness. You start walking away from the Lord. Because your mind is not sharp. Because you've just constantly worked it to death. Don't do that. Don't be a foolish worker. Don't be foolish in the way you do things. Because when you do that, and you're that way, and you're not sharp, and you're not on point, and you're not doing things, as it says here, the, the serpent bites before it's charmed. You fail to do things correctly. See, the charmer, he had to charm the serpent, but he wanted his money, so he reached too quickly, and then get bit. So he didn't get paid, because he didn't charm the serpent. That's what happens if you're not sharp. You will do things, and the serpent will bite you. And he will draw you down a path. And you will be lost and confused and bitter and angry and doing foolish things rather than walking the path of wisdom. Don't do that. Stay calm. Stay focused. Stay good. And don't let your words take you out. Because your words will demonstrate what you are. 12 tells us, you know, the wise man wins favor, but the lips of a fool consume him. Do you want to have favor or do you want to be condemned? See, with favor, you know when to talk. Again, we're back to that point. Just shut up sometimes. I'm one of the world's worst. I'll argue and debate with a fence post. 
office hours and let myself an office earlier about something. I won. But <laughs> find the one an argument. It's great. Other means not too happy with that. But anyway. But still, sometimes we just got to. We've got to just stop and be wise with how we talk. And you know, sometimes one of the best things you can tell somebody is, I don't know. Or it could be, let me think about that and get back at you. Or it could be, you may be right, I have no idea. It's okay to be wrong. It truly is. You can be wrong, and it's not bad to be wrong. Because you know what happens when you're wrong and you admit, I was wrong? You may learn something that you didn't know. It's okay to be wrong. So we need to be cautious with that because if not, our voices, it's that old saying, you know, you just keep on digging that hole, buddy. Just keep on digging. You keep digging, you're not going to dig your way out. It's going to keep getting deeper. We've got to be careful with that because we will be consumed. We will be confused and we will be shown to be unreasonable. It's verse 13 tells us. You know, the beginnings of, the, of his words, of his mouth, is foolishness. And the end of his talk is evil madness. We're unreasonable sometimes. We get to that point like it don't matter. Somebody have a hundred different pieces of evidence laid before you showing you where you're wrong. You're like, I don't care, that's all wrong. I know I'm right. We've all been there. I have. No matter what was played before me, I'm like, no, 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 wrong. <laughs> Okay, yeah, whatever. That, they may have a hundred pieces of evidence within the hundred pieces of evidence on each one to show you're wrong, but we become unreasonable when we do that. We just, we just continue to argue and debate and do things, and we show that we're fools. And that can lead to evil madness. How many times, I'm sure several people in here know of this, that an argument, and somebody gets unreasonable, has led to physical altercation. It shouldn't have happened. Maybe somebody getting killed. This shouldn't have happened. That's the evil madness that it can lead to when we're foolish and we don't control it. We become uncontrolled, we become boastful, we become arrogant, we become ignorant, and we act as the foolish leader that he talked about that shouts down wisdom rather than embracing wisdom and going, hey, I'm wrong. Okay. Or maybe you might think you're still right, but you know what? When it starts getting elevated, you're just screaming and yelling at each other. Nobody's going to win. So it's time to just go, we'll table this. We'll talk about it later. And you think on it, we come back, and one of you's going to be like, hey, you know what? I was wrong. I was stupid there. My bad. Don't hate me. We need to have control. Because as it goes on and shows here in 14 and 15, the fool multiplies words. Now no man knows what is to be, and who can tell him what will be after him? And it's the toil of the fool wearies him, for he does not know the way to the city. You become weary, you become worn out because you're stupid and won't shut up. You just keep on and on and on. And then you get to this boastful aspect where you're just so smart. You're smarter than everybody else there. Nobody can tell you any different. That is stuff we've got to avoid because it leads to a dark path that will draw you down. And then nobody wants to talk to you because every time they talk to you about something, I guess it's, it's impossible to talk to them. If you're a parent and you have children, maybe take some of this advice too. And he did because sometimes, yeah, you may be right, but kids are still learning, and then we get overbearing, and we push down, and we look like an uncontrollable fool because we just keep pressing. When sometimes we need to go, we will talk about this later. Because we can't always win. We can't. Even if you're right, sometimes you have to stop. And how we do that? This last section is the most important because in 16 through 20, this is where he really gives us the application. We need to be on guard. As I said, reading this, it shows the path of foolishness. So 16, woe well, the whole land of the king. If your king is a child, your prince is feast in the morning. Happy is the one whose son of nobility. See, we've got to be on guard because there's going to be many things in life like this 
that's going to draw us away. Yeah, the land, everything will be happy if you have a wise leader. And you have somebody who does things at the proper time and has things done right, done correctly. All of that will lead to more joy and happiness. But the thing is, even if we don't have that, we can still have joy and peace and we need to be cautious in how we do things. We need to be mature. We need to be wise. We need to be focused. We need to be prudent. We need to be intelligent in how we handle things. Because sometimes we let our mouth, even in wisdom, overload us. Because we're mad at people. We're irritated. We're angry and we say things like this stupid idiot doing this and then it leads down a bad path and draws other people in. And sometimes, even though it's not your fault, but sometimes some of the words you say, some of the anger you expel, some of the stuff you put out to other people, they hear it, they get to thinking, they brew on it, they stew on it, then they start developing up an idea, and then they hand it off to another. And then before you know it, somebody has carried out an act of wickedness from something you shout and say. It happens all the time. Our words get out to other people. He goes on and says it may get back to the king. It may get back to them. It may get there because you've said this in verse 20. It goes on. It may be carried there. But the problem is, is we have to be cautious of how we talk. It's all about our speech. This whole section covers our speech and how we act. Because we can say some things, and I firmly believe words, whatever. They're not. The old saying, sticks and stones gonna break my bones, but your words will never hurt me. I believe that. But people can say some things that can cause people to go and use the sticks and stones if we're not careful. So we've got to be on guard. We've got to be mature. We've got to use wisdom. We've got to have insight. We've got to live a life that is above. Because as Paul said, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. Too often we have adults who are still childlike. Too often we have adults who are children in mindset because they have never matured. There are people that might be 70 years old that are still a child. And I'm not talking because they have a mental problem, like something physically wrong, but they just have never matured. So we've got to mature. We've got to have this. We've got to know the proper time to do things. As verse 17 says, where it talks about it, it says, feasting at the proper time for strength and not drunkenness. You eat and you do things to live. You have to have it. So there's other things in life we do the same thing. There's time for everything. In first, as chapter 3 told us, there is a time and a season for everything. It takes maturity to know when to do some of those things. We must mature. We must grow. We must get past this because if we don't, we're going to stay a child. And as a child, you're not going to be very productive. As it goes on and says, the, for soft, the roof sinks in. And through indolence, the house leaks. If we don't ever try to fix the problems, it's because we have not grown up and we're not going to be productive. We're being lazy. We're going to be a sloth. We're not going to do anything. We're going to see people dying every day, going to hell, and go, how oh, will somebody do something? When we have the power and the ability to do it. Choose the path of the right. And walk in wisdom, walk in insight, walk in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ who came and died and suffered for you and sent the Holy Spirit to indwell you and lead you into all truth and give you the power to go. That is what we need to do. We have to be productive. We have the power of the Spirit, the same Spirit that rose Jesus Christ from the dead inside you. Not a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power and love. And what is love? Very love hath no man that he who laid down his life for his friends. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. By this we know love through him who gave himself for us. That is love. And that is what you have inside you. So are you going to be productive? Or are you going to let the roof cave in? That's the question. That is the question. And then are we going to be prudent? I know, that's a big word. Different word. 
Paul is talking about his wisdom and righteousness. Are we going to walk in that? Or are we going to let just try to party it up and drink and party and let money be the answer for everything? Are we going to be foolish that way? Are we going to walk that path? Are we going to live a life where money is the root of all kinds of evil? Money itself isn't bad. It's the love of money that is bad. But if we're walking, if we have grown in maturity, if we're no longer childish, and we're being productive for the Lord, we'll be using wisdom, we'll have prudence in everything we do. We'll eat to have strength. Let's continue going and fighting in this battle. Because we are in a battle. Whether you know it or not, there is a battle being waged every single day, all around you, all through the world, everywhere. And Satan is leading the charge, and it is going on, and they are winning. Because the church is sitting on their butts, doing nothing. We're not being productive. We're not being prudent. We're not being mature. We're sitting back, letting the world go to hell. And going, why is this happening? Why? And you know the crazy thing? In 1948, here in America, is when a lot of it started happening. When the Supreme Court said religious teaching has no room in the schoolhouse. 1948 started the decline. We need to be free in all we do. But don't let that take away your caution. You must be cautious. This is the main thing. Whatever we do, we've got to be careful. There is a time to speak and a time not to speak. A time to do and a time not to. We've got to be careful. But the main thing we need to be careful is we don't need to be condemnatory of people. We don't need to be ridiculing people and making horrible, harsh claims against people. And, you know, just because you may not like the political leader in there, you don't say these derogatory things because people hear that. And what that does is to some other people is set them off in an idea where they're like, I'm not going to listen to this person because listen to what they just said. And if that ever gets back to some of these other people, if you ever try to share Christ with them, what's going to happen? You've already got a mountain to climb. And by those words you spoke that got back to them, you just made that mountain even worse. We've got to be cautious in what we say and how we act. Because what we say will cause grief. And then it'll cause bitterness. Then it'll cause anger. Sometimes we have that here. We have that. We're mad. We have a righteous anger at this world because it is going down a dark path. It is heading to hell. There are people dying and going to hell regularly. And we should be mad at all these people that are misleading them, especially the false teachers in the church that won't speak of hell, that won't speak of sin. They're too afraid to call sin, sin. We should have an anger over that, but we shouldn't be out there labeling and ridiculing people that way. We should just constantly preach the word. And that's not just on me. We're all servants of Christ. We all are to preach the word. You may have anxiety. You may be concerned. You may be worried. Peter tells us, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. And the psalmist said, commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. We need to stop going out and doing foolish things and just share Christ and trust him to act. We sell seeds, people. The Lord is the one who draws. The Holy Spirit draws. The word of God is spirit written through men. As Peter also tells us, and I don't have this one, they said there's no prophecy, one that was written by man, but every man was guided by the Holy Spirit who wrote this. Paul said, all scripture is God-breathed, valuable for teaching and for rebuke and for the man of God to be equipped in all things. We need to just share that, get it out there, and trust the Lord, let him fill us with his wisdom and deliver things out and let the Holy Spirit work. He is one that draws and saves. We just give the message of the good news of Jesus Christ. Well, we tell people, 
He who knew no sin became sin for you so you can become the righteousness of God. Through him you have that. That's what we need to do. We don't need to go, this person's an idiot. We're going to go over here, stupid, blah, 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 you know, all this thing. Yeah, we need to call sin, sin. And we need to say it's sin and say why it's a sin. But we don't need to be calling names and doing all this stuff. We need to just say, these people are in sin. We need to pray for them. We need to let them know who Jesus Christ is and let the Holy Spirit work. But you've got to be mature. You've got to grow up in the Lord and be walking that path of wisdom. That's the only way to get there. And we all fail. I'm notorious for calling people idiots. Guilty. Thank God for his grace and his convicting spirit inside me that tells me that was foolish. That's what we rely on. Trust in him, and he will guide you. Lean on him, and he will guide you. The Lord is good, and holy, and righteous, and he will reach people that we think are too far gone. Let us live a life that does that. Let us walk that path of righteousness. Let us walk that path of faith. Let us constantly seek him and see what happens to this world. Amen. Do we close in prayer? Lord, we thank you for our many blessings that you've given us. And help us all to walk that path, that right path, as we go about our everyday and go about our business and the things that we do. So that other people will see that path. I'm trying to go on it for